Good evening. Welcome to SMU and to this Center for Presidential, this Center for Presidential History event. I am Lai Yi Liang, I'm a fellow at the Center for Presidential History. Many of you are familiar with our uh, center's book lectures, and uh, if you're not, you should become familiar with them. We have flyers on the table uh, outside if you haven't really picked one up. But today's event is a little different. It's part of our center's third rail series. The third rail of politics, as you know, refers to an issue that is so contentious that any politician or policymaker who broaches the subject or questions the conventional wisdom about it will suffer politically. Well, we at CPH are less afraid of controversy. We go where angel, angels fear to tread. Once a semester, we take on a complex contemporary issue, we ask the tough questions and hope that through discussion and debate, we gain some new insight. Today's provocative topic is, does the Middle East still matter? The US has been deeply involved in the Middle East since 1945. Despite attempts at pivoting, we seem unable to quit the region. Access to oil with all its geopolitical implications was a core interest, and then came 9-11 and the war on terror. Thousands of American soldiers have given their lives there, and trillions of dollars have gone to the region, not only through direct conflict, but also in military aid to regimes there. But is the strategic landscape changing now? The ISIS caliphate is gone, and the US has now achieved energy independence. As one recent essay in the National Interest declared, America no longer needs the Middle East. Americans are weary of so-called forever wars that cost us blood and treasure. President Trump's order for US troops to pull out of Syria is certainly consistent with this sentiment. We're fortunate to have three panelists today whose collective expertise in the region could help us answer this tough question. Does the Middle East still matter? Let me introduce them. Robert Jordan is Senior Fellow and Diplomat in Residence at SMU's Tower Center for Public Policy and International Affairs. He was ambassador to Saudi Arabia under President George W. Bush. Until his retirement, he was a partner at the law firm Botts Baker, Baker Botts, in charge of its offices in the Middle East. Ambassador Jordan offers deep knowledge about the geopolitics of the region. Bruce Bullock, I'm sorry, actually I should start with Gregory Brew. Gregory Brew earned his PhD from Georgetown University and is now postdoctoral fellow at CPH. His work focuses on US-Iranian relations, the international oil industry, and the Cold War. He has published in many scholarly and news media outlets, including a latest op-ed in the Washington Post on Monday. It offers reflections on the 40th anniversary of the start of the hostage crisis in Tehran, and I highly recommend that you read it. Dr. Brew will address the question of Iran in US foreign policy. And then finally, we have Bruce Bullock, who is director of the McGuire Energy Institute at SMU's Cox School of Business. Before SMU, he spent 25 years in the oil and gas industry, most recently as communications director at FMC Technologies. Mr. Bullock will share his insider understanding of the politics and economics of oil. I will start by asking our panelists one general question that they will take turns answering to frame the issue at hand. Then I will ask each panelist a question more specific to their expertise. All of that should take about 30 to 40 minutes, and then I hope we'll be able to take many questions from the audience, from you, for the rest of the hour. So to my first question, it's actually three questions, but they amount to the same thing. And it's for each of you to answer in turn. Does the Middle East really matter to US grand strategy? Do we still have vital interests there? 
Ought we not be paying attention to great power politics, to China, Russia, India, and so on? So Bob, would you like to take a stab at that first? The, uh, the question is, uh, I think, a, a complex question. Uh, both President Obama and President Trump, uh, for years, have tried to get out of the Middle East. Uh, there has been a sense that, uh, certainly with energy independence, uh, America is less dependent on the Middle East, uh, and uh, we have sacrificed a lot for uh, very little gain. Uh, President Obama famously gave an interview uh, to The Atlantic in which he said the Saudis had been free riders uh, and it was time for them to take charge of their own neighborhood. Uh, we've had uh, former Secretary of Defense Bob Gates say that uh, the Saudis uh, want to fight every crisis until the last American. <clears throat> uh, the Arab world certainly thinks uh, that uh, the United States is abandoning uh, the Middle East, but I would caution that they have felt this way many times before. Uh, during the time I served, uh, after 9-11, uh, they were worried that we were also not going to be there, even though there were protests in the streets that we had our military troops on their sacred soil. President Obama ran for election, uh, promising to withdraw uh, from Iraq. Um, by the time President Obama left office, though, we, had, we still had 60,000 troops in the Middle East. Today we have 60,000 troops in the Middle East. The grand strategy part of this question is especially difficult to handle. Uh, it's unclear from uh, the Obama years that there was much of a grand strategy, uh, particularly with regard to Syria uh, and Libya. Uh, in Syria, uh, he said Assad must go. Uh, he declared a red line on the use of chemical weapons against their own population, and then he backed away from it. Trump gave Turkey a green light to remove the Kurds. Uh, he then deployed troops to guard the Syrian oil fields. Uh, when the largest oil complex in the world was hit in Saudi Arabia at Abqaiq, uh, there was no response. Yet. America then deployed 2,000 troops along with air defense systems that, by the way, don't work against drones or cruise missiles, which is what hit Abqaiq in the first place. But if, uh, if the U.S. had a grand strategy today, uh, the Middle East would still matter. The Middle East is still full of terrorists uh, who have a record of attacking New York, Washington, D.C., London, and Paris and they're still out there, the threat continues. We rely on Middle East intelligence to preempt attacks and learn about threats. The Saudis have helped us in many times uh, thwart an attack on our homeland. Uh, the Kurds provided critical intelligence in taking out uh, Baghdadi uh, in Syria. But of course that intelligence will now be lost because they indeed feel abandoned correctly uh, by us. Some of the world's main shipping lines run through the Middle East, through the Persian Gulf, around the Arabian Peninsula, up in the Red Sea through the Suez Canal. Uh, these, uh, these transit routes uh, transmit uh, somewhere around 40% of the world's oil. And even though America is largely energy independent, but not solely, the rest of the world uh, counts heavily on this oil we would have a, a cataclysmic worldwide recession, if not depression, if those shipping lanes were uh, interfered with for any significant period of time. I think I should also point out, and I think uh, Bruce will cover this as well, America still imports about 10% of its oil, and a certain percentage of, uh, uh, a healthy percentage of that comes from the Middle East. Most of it comes from Canada. but. Uh, we still need certain varieties of crude oil for the particular refineries that we have here in the United States, and so it's not uh, as simple as some people would have it. The nuclear threat from Iran uh, is an important uh, threat. It's an important threat existentially to Israel, our 
close ally, it's an existential threat to Saudi Arabia. Uh, we have an, a, a national interest in making sure that that threat doesn't mature. Israel's security is a major uh, American national interest, uh, not simply because uh, our political leaders are influenced by Israel's lobbyists, but also because they are the sole uh, shining democracy uh, in the Middle East right now. A very important economic force, and interestingly, increasingly of uh, the same mind with the Saudis and Emiratis in terms of the review of Iran. Saudi Arabia is a major ally despite the problems we have with them today. Uh, they are a pillar to countering Iran. Uh, they are uh, uh, essential to our strategy in containing Iran uh, and balancing uh, the balance of power uh, in the Middle East. We continue to have bases throughout the Middle East. Kuwait, Bahrain, the Emirates, and Qatar, uh, with deployments in other countries uh, as well. Our largest base in the Middle East is in Qatar. We can pay attention to great power politics uh, with China and Russia. At the same time, we maintain at least a level of interest and leveling of engagement in the Middle East. We can do that by leading in the Middle East. It doesn't mean we have to have our troops on the ground. Uh, sadly, I think uh, uh, abandoning the Kurds uh, really abandoned a very efficient use of uh, an alliance. The Kurds provided the ground troops. They sacrificed between 11,000 and 13,000 lives, uh, and they provided a, a critical uh, delta, if you will, uh, in the ability uh, to maintain uh, order in that part of Syria. China is an economic power. And it's not an existential threat right now to the United States. It doesn't mean that we have to somehow divert all resources from the Middle East to attend to China. We don't have to send all of our aircraft carriers to the South China Sea. Uh, Russia, uh, likewise, is in many ways a fading power, even though they have played their hand in the Middle East brilliantly uh, in the last several years. They have had a minimal investment for a maximum return. They have elbowed. Uh, the United States out of Syria, but they in many ways are a declining power. Their demographics are terrible, uh, they're in population decline, uh, their economy is the size of Italy, but they have nuclear weapons. Uh, and so they are a force to be reckoned with, but I would say with respect to both China and Russia, the greatest threat from them is cyber. It is not that we're going to have Chinese or Russian missiles in our backyards anytime soon. The, uh, did you want me to address, address the uh, subcontracting question, or is that for later? That's for later. Okay, great. Well, I will turn it over to the next speaker. Thank you. Thanks very much, Professor Leung, for... Uh, uh, taking part in this event, and I would also thank uh, Director Bullock and Ambassador Jordan for taking part. Uh, in order to maintain this sense of brevity, I'm going to activate my stopwatch. Um, <laughs> Professor Leung was correct. Uh, I am a historian who primarily works on U.S.-Iranian relations, so that's the question I'm going to tackle, uh, and I'm going to take an Iranian spin on the question that you provided, Professor Leung. Um, and get to your question on great power politics uh, by way of answering the question of why the Middle East still matters, and specifically, why does Iran uh, still matter, and why should it matter to the United States? And I'm going to tackle that question first. I think I, I came up with seven reasons uh, why Iran matters. Uh, I'm then going to discuss a little bit about the policy the United States has taken towards Iran most recently, um, you know, the United States has, of course, had a very long relationship with Iran going back uh, really until World War II, as Professor Leung mentioned. Um, but I'm going to cover the more recent period. I'm then going to throw out uh, some options for courses of action that the U.S. could take um, moving forward. So why does Iran matter to the United States? The seven reasons. Reason number one, Iran is a large, populous state. It has a population of just over 80 million people. That's slightly larger than Turkey, about twice as many as Saudi Arabia, with a developed industrialized economy 
that unlike other, region, other nations in the region is not overwhelmingly dependent on oil. Uh, it is of course a major oil producer. In 2017, oil accounted for about 43% of exports for Iran compared to about 78% for Saudi Arabia. So while it is a major oil and gas producer, which I'll be getting to in a moment, Iran uh, is in many ways a large, resilient economy. Um, the second reason, as I mentioned, Iran is a major producer of oil and gas. It, is, it possesses the fourth largest oil reserves of any nation on Earth and the second largest gas reserves, reserves that are constantly being uh, updated as new gas is discovered. The third reason, Iran is strategically uh, it's located in a very strategically important location, astride the major oil and gas fields of the Persian Gulf. Um, the Strait of Hormuz, which Ambassador Jordan uh, mentioned, is one of the most important waterways uh, in the world, through which about 30% of the world's oil passes every day. Iran also lays astride the Caucasus Mountains, Central Asia, the Caspian Sea littoral region. It has uh, coastlines bordering the Indian Ocean, as well as the Persian Gulf. Um, it's once been quoted that even if Iran had no oil and gas, it would still be a nation um, of importance uh, in geopolitics. Uh, the fourth, and now we're getting to more, the more important reasons. Uh, the fourth reason, Iran has a very active foreign policy. It has uh, multiple regional proxies and allies uh, through which it exercises this foreign policy. These groups include Hezbollah in Lebanon, a variety of Shia militias in Syria and Iraq, the Houthi rebels in Yemen, and it has used this, uh, these, this regional influence, its regional reach, if you will, to involve itself in the internal politics of its neighbors, often to destabilizing effect. This is something Iran has been doing um, increasingly since the Islamic Revolution of 1978-79. However, even before the revolution, Iran uh, had a growing regional influence under the Shah. It uh, had regional ambitions. So this is the fifth reason. Apart from an active foreign policy, the fifth reason is Iran aspires towards regional leadership and has developed multiple regional rivalries. Ambassador Jordan has touched on a few of these. Uh, it has grown into a confrontational status against Saudi Arabia and the Gulf uh, Council. It has also um, become increasingly confrontational towards Israel. Uh, and this uh, attempt at uh, extending this regional influence has created increasing instability affecting regional security. Uh, just a few instances. The attack on Abqaiq in September, uh, multiple attacks on oil tankers, the downing of a US drone in June of 2019, an instance which very nearly led to President Trump ordering uh, military strikes against Iran. Repeated threats to close the Strait of Hormuz, the waterway through which 30% of all global oil passes each day. Getting to Professor Leung's point, this question of great power politics, Iran has developed relationships with China and Russia. A recent book came out declaring Iran, China, and Russia as a triple axis uh, through which they've concluded energy deals, engaged in Central Asian, South Asian diplomacy. They are, of course, both Russia and Iran are very in, uh, involved in the war in Syria. And finally, and perhaps most importantly, in the last 30 years, or so, the government in Iran has pursued nuclear technologies, potentially towards acquiring, developing and uh, acquiring a nuclear weapon. Uh, the manner in which it has pursued this technology would suggest the ability to construct a nuclear weapon posing a serious nuclear proliferation risk. Um, so to conclude, even if the United States was determined to pull away from the Middle East, engaging with Iran in a meaningful way represents a fund fundamental concern given Iran's ongoing activities, its confrontational attitude vis-a-vis -vis other states in the region, its potential nuclear ambitions, its size and regional importance, and of course its place in global geopolitics. I would note here that Iran by itself does not pose a military threat to the United States. It's a fairly uh, small military. Its military spending uh, is about $19 billion a year compared to Saudi Arabia, which spends about 67 billion. However, allowing tensions to continue to escalate between Iran and its regional neighbors, uh, you saw some of this in the news recently, the ongoing demonstrations in Iraq are in many ways inspired by Iran's involvement in Iraq's internal uh, politics. This regional adventurism 
uh, influence peddling in Baghdad, Damascus, and elsewhere, Iran's relationship with China and Russia, and its threat to the flow of oil through the Persian Gulf and in the Middle East more generally, should bring about a US response and a more active US engagement. Um, I'm running low on time, so I'm going to skip the second half of my answer and uh, keep it for later Q&A, and I'm gonna pass things over to Director Bullock. Thank you. Well, thank you, and it's, uh, it's a pleasure to be with you tonight. I'm gonna focus a little bit more on the energy side and whether or not uh, uh, the Middle East matters, so to speak, and I, I think the ambassador accurately put it. It may not matter as much to us anymore uh, from an energy perspective, but it certainly matters to the world. Uh, but I, just a few figures to start out with to kind of put it in production in terms, or, or put it into, uh, perspective in terms of where the U.S. is now. Um, current U.S. oil production right now is about 12.6 million barrels a day. Um, in 2008, it was a little bit more than 10 years ago, it was 3.8 million barrels a day. So the difference is shale. And you can see it's, it's, a, it's a big difference. On a gross basis, total U.S. imports per day are about 9.9 .9 million barrels a day. Um, 29 of which is, 29% of that is from OPEC countries, 16% uh, of that is from uh, the Persian Gulf countries. So um, um, it is still a, a significant portion of, of, of our imports. Um, however, the U.S. exports oil now as well, uh, 7.6 million barrels a day. So our net imports are about 2.3 million barrels a day right now. Uh, which is roughly 10% of um, our consumption. Um, but as the ambassador said, it's, it's not as easy as uh, one barrel in, one barrel out. Uh, you have different grades of crude around the world, and you have different refineries that can uh, pro process different grades of crude. Um, ideally, we have some of the lightest, sweetest grades of crude in the world and it should sell for some of the highest prices. Ideally, you wanna sell that at the highest price and buy some of the lower grade crudes from around the world that our, our uh, refineries are uh, tuned to be able to process, and that's to our economic benefit. Uh, so in that regard, certainly the, uh, the Middle East does matter. Uh, let's contrast all that with the current situation with 1996 when the U.S imported 8.5 million barrels a day, or about 46% of our needs. And so as you can see, shale has, has made a difference. I'll focus a, a minute on the attack on the Saudi oil uh, facilities. On September 19th, you know, drones were used to attack state-owned Saudi Aramco uh, facilities at, at locations in eastern Saudi Arabia. The infrastructure took roughly 5.6 million barrels a day, or about 5% of global oil production out. Um, the, the Iran backed Houthi movement claimed responsibility. The US and Saudi Arabia uh, would argue that Iran may have been directly responsible due to the location and sophistication of the strike. That's um, kind of beyond my, uh, my scope here tonight. But previous to this event, uh, that would have been considered an Armageddon-level event in oil markets. Um, that was the largest supply shock ever uh, on both an absolute and, and a percentage basis. Instead, pretty much turned out to be a non-event. Um, initially, spot, rep, spot prices rose about 10% uh, in the first couple of days. Uh, but if you look at the long end of the curve, and those of you who are uh, uh, oil gurus or oil analysts that look at those kinds of things, uh, know that the long end of the curve in the future years actually went down. And the thought was that uh, because shale can come on so quickly in a matter of weeks or months as opposed to years, additional production would uh, come onto the market to take up for it and then we'd be reluctant to turn around then and take it off, so prices would eventually go down. Uh, as it turned out, the Saudis were able to meet their export obligations out of 
uh, inventories, and uh, you know, pretty much the same non-reaction has occurred uh, as tankers have been held hostage. Um, the speed at which the Saudis were able to uh, restore their facilities uh, surprised a lot of industry observers. I was at a conference in London, and there were probably half a dozen CEOs that were there, major oil companies, and, uh, and they were quite shocked. But really, when you think about it, it, it shouldn't have. Uh, the, the oil service industry in this country has been uh, putting oil fields back online since the first Gulf War uh, in a relatively expeditious manner. And Aramco is also in the process of an IPO. Uh, so they have a lot to lose uh, if they didn't get it back online and get it back online quickly. We'll probably talk about the IPO a little bit in, uh, in questions and answers. But the lack of a market response really traced a couple of things. One, the, US, the, the global market's well supplied, uh, including U.S. shale. The lack of a, a, a military response by the U.S. or the Saudi Arabia kept the, kept the market from being escalated further or the situation from being escalated further. But it's not just shale, it's kind of beyond shale. Um, the lack of an oil market response is really directly correlated to, to what capital markets are thinking now. A any of you that owned oil stocks of the past year and a half or two years understand what I'm talking about, uh, including, including myself. Market valuations on oil companies globally are at an all-time low. Um, this industry faces a number of uh, disruptors in the next uh, 10 years, um, most notably natural gas, LNG on a global basis, renewables, uh, public policy headwinds globally towards oil. Uh, so the capital markets themselves um, uh, are openly recognizing that we're transitioning away from oil. Now you can argue about how much and how quickly that's going to occur. Uh, if you're on one side of the equation, you may argue that that should occur quickly, 10 years, and uh, to a lower carbon economy. So, uh, others would say, no, it's going to take 100 years. But there is a recognition that we are transitioning to a lower carbon economy. So what does this mean for U U.S. relations um, uh, in the Middle East? Well, the market for oil is still a global one. Uh, free movement of oil and goods and services uh, shipping and so forth is a vital U.S. interest for global growth. Reasonably priced available uh, oil goes hand in hand with global GDP, GDP growth, which is vital for the U.S. economy. Um, and on a longer term basis, the Middle East still remains a lucrative market for U.S. oilfield service companies. Uh, the U.S. oilfield service industry is the leading oil fill service industry in the world, technologically, expertise, equipment, you name it. Um, it's an industry that can't just create a market. It has to go where the oil goes. And the majority of the oil reserves are still in, in the Middle East. So this is not something we want to cede over time uh, to, uh, uh, to other countries. Uh, certainly from an economic perspective. So with that, um, I'll sit down and be happy to take questions. So I'm going to ask the first questions. All of you, th thank you, all of you have so bravely taken a stab, a first stab uh, at, at this tough question. Um, but now I want to get uh, more specific. So my first follow-up question to Ambassador Jordan is this. You mentioned that Saudi Arabia remains a pillar uh, of U.S. policy in the region. Some observers have said that we have actually become quite accommodationist, too accommodationist. Some have even gone so far as to say that we might have, we are subcontracting our strategy, our policy, foreign policy. Uh, in the Middle East to Saudi Arabia. Do you think that's a fair assessment? Uh, and uh, where do you think that might take us? Well, I guess first you have to figure out what that policy is. 
Uh, we have had some difficulty in recent years figuring out what our policy in the Middle East is going to be, and particularly how it relates to Saudi Arabia. Uh, it does appear that uh, the Saudis and the Israelis have uh, constructed a narrative uh, in which Iran is an existential threat to both of them, and that is not entirely inaccurate. Um, and thus, that threat uh, implicates U.S. national interests. But I think when we talk about policy, uh, it isn't their policy that we need to focus on, it's what our policy is. Uh, when I went out to, when I was getting ready to go out to be ambassador uh, in Saudi Arabia, I was talking with my law partner, James Baker, and he said, Bob, don't get clientitis. And by that, of course, he meant don't fall in love with your host country. And there's a great story about Secretary of State George Shultz meeting with a convocation of ambassadors, U.S. ambassadors from all around the world. And he turned to one of them and said, what is your country? And they said, Egypt. The other one, well, what is your country? Uh, Venezuela. And he said, no, ladies and gentlemen, your country is the United States of America. Don't you ever forget it. And so when we talk about policy, uh, there are certainly Saudi and Israeli interests that are being served, uh, and they are taking a lead in some ways in articulating what those policies are, but they don't equate necessarily to American policy. For example, uh, the Saudis have uh, conducted a feudal war in Yemen with disastrous consequences. Uh, America has helped them. We've provided munitions, we've provided intelligence and reconnaissance. Uh, but the Saudis have launched that war and seem to have no means of ending it, and it may take the United States coming in and saying we're no longer going to provide spare parts for your F-15s, at least in, uh, until you uh, order a ceasefire and begin uh, negotiations. Um, we initially supported the Saudi blockade of Qatar, uh, largely because Al Jazeera had offended the Saudis and Emiratis and uh, had been critical uh, of, of the kingdom and supported the Muslim Brotherhood, uh, anathema uh, to the Saudis uh, and Emiratis. So uh, we have a lot going on in the Middle East at the hands of the Saudis, to a lesser degree the Israelis, uh, that I think we have to uh, look out for American interests on and not simply take uh, what the Saudis perceive as their interests. One of the most vivid, of course, is a year ago, the murder and dismemberment of Jamal Khashoggi, the American resident uh, Saudi journalist who was killed in the Saudi consulate in Istanbul. We looked the other way. Uh, I think we are not serving American interests by doing that. So uh, whether it's a good strategy remains to be seen. I think a lot depends in the future on where, th where this Saudi crown prince, Mohammed bin Salman, ends up. Um, if he continues reckless adventurism, uh, I think we're going to have to have a stricter view of uh, what we indulge the Saudis in, in, in doing. Uh, I think we also uh, have to look at, uh, just today was announced, the Saudis apparently had spies in Twitter uh, uh, downloading information about dissidents around the world and using their positions in Twitter to invade these accounts. Uh, we, we have simply got to get in their face and say, no more. Uh, so uh, if the Saudis, on the other hand, and if this crown prince learns his lessons uh, of the last three years of his uh, leadership, uh, there's a role for them to play, and I think we should be strong partners for the reasons I stated in my opening uh, comments. Okay, thank you. Now I have a question, a specific question for Dr. Brew. Um, Greg, you mentioned that um, Iran is important to us, uh, but Iran is also aggressive, an aggressive state. So what kind of Iranian state can we live with? What should we do about Iran? So to repeat Ambassador Jordan's point, the first question is coming up with a strategy, coming up with a policy. And there is a policy, there is a US policy towards Iran right now. Um, it's began with the withdrawal from the JCPOA, the nuclear deal concluded by the Obama administration with the Islamic Republic of Iran in 2015. The, to go back in time a little bit, the Obama administration took a look at Iran. This is a problem every U.S. administration has had since 1979. 
what to do about Iran, how to deal with this state that appears uh, almost like a rogue state. And the Obama administration's approach was to increase pressure through economic sanctions while simultaneously engaging with the Islamic Republic on the basis of this agreement to try to keep it from acquiring a nuclear weapon. Th those negotiations took a long time to conclude. They did conclude in July of 2015 with an agreement known as the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action. It was not a perfect agreement. Uh, it, had, uh, it had flaws. It was limited to the Iranian nuclear program. Um, and the Obama administration also had an idea that through this agreement, through this negotiation, which was the first real diplomatic accord reached between the United States and Iran since 1979, this would encourage the Iranian leadership to slowly re-enter the international community. President Obama said on a number of occasions, although he was very careful to condition his statements, that this would encourage moderates inside Iran to bring Iran back into the international fold. Whether or not that would have happened is no longer relevant because last year the Trump administration withdrew from the JCPOA. The administration's argument was that Iran was not abiding by the terms of the agreement, that it was continuing to pursue a nuclear weapon, although the International Atomic Energy Agency continued to say that it was abiding by the terms of the JCPOA. The United States withdrew from the agreement, and the new policy, the Trump administration's policy, has come to be known as maximum pressure. This maximum pressure campaign is designed to tighten a vice around Iran, reduce its oil uh, revenues to zero. Um, Iranian oil exports have fallen, I think, from 2 million barrels per day to less than 500,000 barrels per day, although knowing for sure how much it's exporting is kind of difficult, with the idea that it will then return to the negotiation table and agree to a new set of terms to replace the old JCPOA. The problem with this policy, as many experts have pointed out, is that the terms laid by the Trump administration do not appear realistic for to bring about uh, a return by the Iranian government. They don't look like terms that any Iranian government would agree to, which has led some to argue that the real purpose of the, pre of the policy is to place so much pressure on Iran that the Islamic Republic falls apart, that the regime collapses, and that some sort of new government takes its place. Um, I personally don't think that's going to happen, and recent evidence would suggest that Iran's economy has survived the shock of these sanctions, that the government is nowhere close to collapsing. In fact, it's sort of closed ranks. Um, so to get to your question, what kind of Iran could the United States live with? Uh, I think the US is going to have to come to some understanding with the idea that this government in Tehran is probably not going anywhere anytime soon. It's been around for 40 years. Uh, Monday was the anniversary, the 40th anniversary of the hostage crisis, and this perpetual question of what kind of relationship do we have with Iran. Iran is a threat to U.S. allies, Saudi Arabia, Israel, and it is a destabilizing force in the region. Um, the problem is, and I think President Trump realized this in June, attacking Iran doesn't do very much. In fact, it probably only encourages the regime, again, to close ranks, to create this idea that it's Iran against the world, to fall back, to become more isolated, and to perhaps even pursue a, the North Korea route, to acquire a nuclear weapon in order to secure its own security, in order to attain this level of security. Um, that happening would be, I think, a major failure for the United States if Iran did, in fact, acquire a nuclear weapon. Um, but the policy being undertaken right now we've already seen evidence of this this week. This week, Iran announced that it is going to resume injecting gas into a thousand centrifuges. It, again, it's being very careful about why it's injecting this gas and what it's doing, but the implication is very clear. It's moving further and further away from this nuclear deal towards a situation where it could potentially acquire a nuclear weapon. And that, I can tell you, is an Iran that the United States cannot and should not be in a position to live with. Thank you. So Bruce, a question for you as well. You mentioned that um, there was a non-reaction from the market when Iran attacked uh, the uh, oil facilities in Saudi Arabia. What sort of event might cause an adverse reaction? And is, is it something that the United States can do something about? Is it something that the United States can prevent? 
Well, I think the, uh, the, 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 the primary event that would cause a reaction would be the closing of the straits. Um, that uh, 30 to 40 percent of the world's oil goes through there, uh, and a number of the powers, the Chinese and others, have a, a huge, huge stake in that. So, and we have a we have a navy that can uh, can can certainly uh, work to keep the straits open. So that would be a, the level of event that would certainly uh, prompt uh, that kind of response. And can we do something about it? Well, yeah, I mean, it's, it's not a matter of can we, it's a matter of will we. Um, it's, uh, I, don't, I don't think anybody would have ever thought sitting here uh, after the attack that occurred in, um, uh, in last mo month and a half ago that that kind of attack would have gone with impunity. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, I think the thought behind that was Pretty much just as you said, the more we attack them, the more they're going to draw ranks uh, against the world, number one. And, and, and number two, treat this somewhat like a tantrum if you ignore it, then uh, it's, um, it's the kind of thing where you won't escalate it. Um, understanding that uh, if you did escalate it, then you might get a reaction out of, out of world markets. So it's, um, I think vigilance is, is certainly a, a key on the U.S. part. And, and reflective of the, uh, the ambassador's remarks earlier, you know, we certainly have global economic interests at stake over there. And uh, you, know, you, you have to maintain some sense of balance and some sense of... Uh, uh, relations and friendship in that region that aren't all in one basket, all your eggs in one basket, if you will. Okay, thank you. Well, we've been keeping to time, which is great. So that leaves plenty of time for uh, questions from you. There is a mic set up right there uh, on this side of the room. So I'm afraid folks on this side will have to meander over. Um, but please uh, introduce yourself uh, and pose your question. Keep it brief uh, so that our panelists may answer your question. Yes, uh, my name is Bruce Dewberry, and my question is, uh, can somebody speak to the geopolitical uh, implications of the Ramco IPO coming up? Well, I'll take the first crack at it. Um, I, I think for global oil markets, it's certainly a steadying move. Uh, because you've got a situation now where uh, the, um, the Saudi Arabians are, are, are not necessarily going to want prices exorbitantly high, but not necessarily going to want them exorbitantly low. So we, we no longer, I, I don't think, have to worry about them flooding the market, if you will, uh, and, and sending prices low. I mean, they're that's going to be valued on a cash basis, on a cash flow basis, that company, and, and they're going to need to generate sufficient cash flow to cover their dividends going forward, and, um, and most of their investors are going to be, at least initially, domestic investors. Uh, and so it's going to be a matter of keeping their own people happy from a geopolitical standpoint as opposed to... Uh, some type of uh, uh, global sort of stock market situation. My name is Ray Termini. Uh, could you speak a little more about the Kurds? There are Kurds in Syria, uh, Iraq, Iran, and Turkey. Yes, they are fighting ISIS, but what is their goal out of this? There have been there have been writers who have indicated that they would like to cause disruptions, at least in countries like Syria and Iraq and um, to, to, in Turkey, to farm their own independent Kurdistan. What is your thought on that? Let me try this. First of all, the Kurds are not a monolithic uh, entity. Uh, the Kurds in uh, Kurdistan and Iraq uh, do not have the same aspirations or political views as the Kurds in Syria. Uh, so the Syrian Kurds, for example, the ones I was talking about who have helped us so much uh, in that conflict, uh, 
had frankly used American air power and our presence to expand their territory uh, in northeastern Syria. Uh, as you might expect, they, they don't have a homeland. Uh, they are scrambling for whatever they can get, and they have assembled now uh, a fairly large pe piece of land. But we have to remember that Syria is a sovereign country, and so uh, self-determination doesn't mean that you have the right to separatism. It doesn't mean that you can create your own state within a sovereign country. But that's clearly what the, the, uh, the Syrian Kurds want. Turkey treats all Kurds in Syria, at least, as uh, terrorists because the PKK version of the Kurds has launched a number of attacks within Turkey. Many of the YPG Kurds, the Syrian Defense Forces who we were working with, also had links to the PKK. And so it, it wasn't as if they had a, a complete wall between the two of them. And that gave pause to the Turks. Uh, and when you're at war, you deal with uh, you know, the allies that you can find. Uh, in, in Iraqi Kurdistan, on the other hand, uh, they have uh, been more militant about creating a, an independent, uh, semi-autonomous state. Barzani made the big mistake of going for an independence referendum, uh, which allowed Baghdad then to come in and, and seize Kirkuk. Um, but they have uh, overall a fairly peaceful environment uh, in uh, Iraq. Uh, they have oil production. There are some disputes with Baghdad about how much of that revenue they share, but uh, they are not at war with each other and, and it's relatively stable right now. My name is Steve Penrose. Uh, uh, I want to thank you all for the presentations that you've made. You've convinced me that the Middle East definitely still matter. Uh, the one, the, I almost turned the question around, uh, which is, does the United States matter in the Middle East? Certainly not to the degree we, we did in the past. Uh, and one of the reasons our policies have been so scrambled is that we've tried various things and been humbled each time we thought we had uh, the right approach. If each of you were to pick one thing that we might do in your area of expertise that would uh, resolve this and would advance American interests in the Middle East, what would it be? <laughs> Greg, you want to get started? Sure. Um, the first thing that comes to mind for me is that um, uh, when the 2015 nuclear deal was signed, there was a tremendous amount of enthusiasm in Tehran among particularly young Iranians. You may have seen some of the photos. There were young men running in the streets with American flags and T-shirts. Um, and there was this sense. And, and some of my friends who have been, they, they travel back and forth. They have family over there. And they were saying there was this immense sense of possibility that this was perhaps the beginning of some thaw. Uh, I think most politicians knew that that wasn't the case on both sides, both in the United States and in Iran. They knew that the state of confrontation would continue. Um, but for a while, there was a sense among Iranians who generally like Americans and like American culture and like Americans as people um, that perhaps this would alleviate some of these tensions. That feeling uh, is no longer there. Uh, there were recent surveys conducted to indicate that, uh, and these surveys aren't always very reliable, but there were surveys conducted to indicate that average Iranians now hold a very negative view of Americans and of the United States. They've always been, there's generally always been suspicion towards the US, but not towards Americans individually. Um, but the last year of sanctions, the maximum pressure campaign, and the withdrawal from the nuclear agreement has, uh, soured um, many Iranians on the idea of a thaw, on the idea of a, of, a, of, a, of, a, of a potential lessening in tensions. So I don't, I mean, I'm, I certainly can't speculate as to what President Trump or, or perhaps whoever wins in the 2020 election might do as far as restarting negotiations. But I do think there is a sense that there needs to be something done to resettle the nuclear question in a way that the JCPOA did. The problem is, is that Tehran has said, we're not going to agree to the JCPOA again. You need to offer us something new. It has to be better. And 
part of the reason why the negotiations were even successful is that there was uh, a relationship formed at the negotiating table between Secretary of State John Kerry and Foreign Minister Javad Zarif that would likely not recur. Um, so I am pessimistic about even a new, even a potential uh, successor to President Trump finding success at the negotiating table. Bruce, do you have something to add to that? Uh, no, I, I think, um, you know, I, t I tend to agree with exactly what was said about the Iranian people. I, you know, I've traveled the world uh, <laughs> with, with the oil industry and, and can genuinely say that uh, uh, the Iranian people were, are, are truly something that, that used to um, respect Americans anyway and certainly used to deal with on a fairly frequent basis. And that's, and it's going to be a long time before that happens again. Uh, and I always like the Iranian people. But uh, I, I would say this, to the extent that the, the economic ties can be rebuilt, oil offers an opportunity there. And uh, we've got technology, we've got expertise that they need. And that is something that we can get into and probably make a difference uh, for the Iranian society and the Iranian people very quickly were we able to uh, uh, be afforded that opportunity once sanctions were lifted. Bob, anything? Broadly speaking, I think we need to recognize that just because we have a hammer, not every problem out there is a nail. And we need to remember there's this thing called diplomacy that can actually be very effective, particularly in supporting some of the aspirations of these people in the Middle East. It's quite interesting that we've seen demonstrations against Iran uh, in both Lebanon and Iraq. Uh, we have seen a brand new Vision 2030 being developed in Saudi Arabia. Supporting these aspirations with our expertise, with our technology, is one piece of it. The other piece is finding a way to resolve uh, this conflict between uh, the Sunni Gulf monarchies and Iran. And uh, there are efforts underway right now. Pakistan is talking about mediating. It's not all about the United States every moment, but we can provide support and encouragement to these diplomatic efforts, which I think are uh, long overdue. Uh, yes, my name is Harold Collum. And I, my question is, uh, as the last two or three decades, there's kind of been a raging dialogue about Wall Street focusing on short-term quarterly reports, quarterly activities. Uh, my sense is that the United States as foreign policy and ambassador, you alluded to kind of a lack of strategy. Also understanding that, that so many of these countries have uh, uh, internal controversies that go back centuries and millennia, what is a strategy that you would, or, or, or that you have maybe even discussed in your circles, that would work long term across parties, across, you know, that's, that's not going to take a short term approach to some of these problems, but take a long term approach? I, I think the notion of preparing these countries in the Middle East for self-governance, for uh, good governance, for elimination of corruption, which has, by the way, been the, the animating force of what was called the Arab Spring in 2011. A lot of it had to do with simply the corruption that they saw. That's also what we're seeing in Iraq and Lebanon today. Those demonstrations are largely about corruption, and they are uh, not ideologically motivated by and large. Uh, they feel that Iran has essentially corrupted their countries, uh, and uh, the Revolutionary Guards have taken up a lot of the patrimony of the countries. So what we can do is help them uh, grow their economies. Uh, when I was ambassador, one of the most important things I worked on was to get the Saudis into the WTO, because if they were invested in the WTO, if they're part of the G20, uh, they had a lot to protect. Uh, and they now feel that, and I think we're seeing the next step they're taking, and I think the rest of these countries could stand to do the same with our help. If I can add to that a little bit, <clears throat> I would 
say exactly what Ambassador Jordan was saying. The protesters, the demonstrators in Iraq who have been coming out in massive numbers. This is, by some accounts, the most profound political event to happen in this way in Iraq since 1958, since the revolution that overthrew the Iraqi monarchy. And the participants in these demonstra demonstrations are overwhelmingly young, and they are calling for precisely what Ambassador Jordan has been saying. They're calling for an end of corruption. And the corruption that they see is tied to Iran in many cases, because as a result of the 2003 invasion of Iraq, Iran was able to enter Iraq, increase its influence, particularly amongst Shia militias, uh, exerted influence over the majority Shia population in those parts of Iraq. Um, but the demonstrators aren't talking about Shiism and Sunnism. They're not talking about the death of the Imam Hussein in 636. They're talking about the end of corruption. And the posters and the demonstrators are saying, one Iraq for Kurds, for Shias, for Sunnis, but in Iraq that is independent and sovereign and has been returned to its people. Um, I would also point out that Iraq is a nation is a 20th century creation. It is not this millennia old idea. It is something that has been born out of modernity. And the politics of the region, yes, do go back centuries, and in some cases millennia. But many of the problems that the United States has become embroiled with are problems that came about in the 20th century and in the early 21st century. And there are problems that the United States can assist with solving. If I could add one thing to that, um, and it's kind of in response to the earlier question as well. And that's one thing about the Saudi IPO um, that is potentially beneficial in the long run, depending upon which way it goes. And, and, and that's the idea, uh, again, towards this corruption issue, is it does force upon them, even though it's only initially going to be traded upon uh, the local exchange there, some degree of transparency and some degree of disclosure uh, that they do not currently have. And um, uh, of course, if it were ever to be moved to the London Exchange or the New York Exchange, it would be far more transparent. They're not likely to do that anytime soon, but still, they have taken steps in that regard. They've gotten an actual uh, reserve audit by a, a U.S. petroleum engineering firm, which nobody ever thought would be done. So the more you can get some trans uh, transparency and some more openness around these kinds of, of uh, efforts, uh, the less likelihood there will be of corruption, or certainly the corruption will be brought forward. My name is Keaton Lytle. My apologies. Uh, if, so in regards to Iran's nuclear program, specifically if, uh, the, if their uranium enrichment continues moving at the same rate that it is right now, how long do we have before we actually have to worry and it becomes a clear and present danger, the program that is? That's a very good question. <clears throat> the short answer is nobody knows. Um, because Iran, the reason why concerns grew around Iran's nuclear program uh, in the 1990s and then in 2003 was that it was uncovered that much of its program was being done in secret. Uh, the leadership of the Islamic Republic, going back to um, Ayatollah Khomeini, has said that a nuclear weapon is a bad idea for religious reasons, for strategic reasons, for economic reasons. Their argument is Iran has every right as a sovereign nation to possess a nuclear program for economic, energy, medical research reasons. Um, the announcement this week was very interesting in the sense that, yes, they announced that they were going to increase the, um, I, I believe it's hexafluoride gas, uranium hexafluoride gas. I'm not a nuclear expert, so I, some of the details elude me, but um, they did announce they were going to increase the gas being placed in about 1,000 centrifuges. Um, whether that leads to a nuclear weapon would be a question of, do they start running their other centrifuges? What they're doing, and this kind of gets to the attacks on the Saudi oil facilities and the attacks on the tankers, these are pinprick maneuvers to test Iran's enemies, including the United States, but particularly Saudi Arabia, Israel, the United Arab Emirates, as well as gestures towards the other signatories to the JCPOA, Europe particularly, to which, with which Iran has quite considerable economic ties. They're Economic ties to the United States aren't very substantial, but Europe is very important economically to Iran. So these maneuvers are meant to send a signal that Iran may decide to quit the nuclear agreement. It hasn't said that it will yet, 
but it could. And that would then potentially place it on a path towards constructing a nuclear weapon. Um, so at this point, that doesn't look hugely likely, but the longer this policy, the longer this confrontation goes on, um, the more likely it becomes. The huge question mark for me, and I think this is what a lot of Iran uh, watchers are kind of waiting for, is the current supreme leader, Ali Khamenei, is not particularly well, and he may either die or become incapacitated in the not too distant future. And there is some question as to who his successor will be and how that will change Iran's foreign policy. So for now, it's likely that they will continue moving away from the JCPOA, but a hard break from the agreement would be a pretty considerable escalation. So with apologies to those still in line, I'm afraid we have to wrap up. Uh, the thing about controversial topics is that you can just keep going on and on and on and on. Thank you to our presenters. Thank you for sharing your unique insights. Um, a video recording of this uh, event will be on our website in a couple of weeks, so please check it out if you feel like you've me uh, missed out on some key observation. Um, I should also mention that the CPH website has an extended video interview that I conducted with Ambassador Jordan uh, a couple of years ago uh, about his time, <laughs> about his time uh, uh, in Saudi Arabia uh, based on his book, Desert Diplomat, another, another piece of work that's worth reading. Um, and uh, uh, rain is in the forecast, cold is in the forecast, so there are worse ways to spend an evening than watching that interview. Um, thank you again, and uh, good night. <laughs>